All right, friends, we're going to jump back into it. Today, we'll, we will be talking about intellectual property protection in the context of sport management. Intellectual property is something that's important to discuss for those who are interested in sport management because sport management oftentimes deals with marketing, branding, sponsorship, and other types of areas where a organization or an individual is working with trademarks or copyrights and sometimes even patents and because these types of uh, intellectual property uh, are important to the success of an organization um, we as future sport managers need to understand what each of these uh, terms of art mean how the concept works in practice and how to make sure that we as uh, employees of that organization don't violate the intellectual property rights of other organizations or other individuals. So therefore, understanding intellectual property is a must. Let's start with a brief example about why we would uh, study intellectual property. On the left is a hat uh, from the University of Miami, a very uh, famous and well-known college uh, or a university and also has a pretty um, pretty well-respected athletic program. On the right is a logo from Spalding University located in Louisville, Kentucky. And if you can see, both of the logos seem to be similar. The color schemes might be different, but the uh, two uh, logos that form a U look similar to the point that we might ask, well, is, is the only thing different between the two hats the color scheme and is there some sort of uh, relationship between the two logos? And in that situation, there could be an issue with intellectual property specific to trademarks. So for us as future sport managers, it's incumbent to understand what a trademark is and what other intellectual property is in terms of what's used in uh within sports organizations and how to properly properly use it and not to violate any the laws related to the intellectual property. So intellectual property in sport um, comes in four to five different aspects here. We, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, the textbook talks about patents, copyrights, trade dress, trademarks, and trade secrets. Now, we're more concerned about trademarks, and that's what the predominant part of this presentation concerns. However, the textbook also talks about patents and copyrights. And how intellectual property works is it's really defined as uh, pr products that we cannot touch. It's intangible. And companies often invest large sums of money and time to develop them so that it can be used to benefit the organization. And that comes in the form of either patents, copyrights, trademarks, or something of the like. So a trademark is intended to distinguish a company's good or service from its competitors in the field and to uh, educate the public about certain characteristics about their good or service. Now, patents copyrights and trade secrets um, don't really educate the consumer and safeguard the consumer about what uh, product or service they're using. Instead, uh, patents, copyrights, and trade, and, and trade secrets reward the organization for their investment in developing technology or um, their development of some sort of creative artistic expression that's been uh, secured in a, some sort of uh, medium like television or the web or radio. And trade secrets are uh, some sort of secret formula or something related to that that an organization comes up with and they are going to use it for a competitive advantage. So patents and copyrights protect inventions and creative works respectively. Trademarks in the law of unfair competition uh, are more about protecting consumers from deceptive trade practices uh, or advertising that competitors might do. Um, 
the principles of trademark law that we're most concerned about uh, come from the Lanham Act. The Lanham, Lanham Act is a federal statute that was passed by Congress and it protects what are called trademarks, which are defined as a word, name, or symbol, or something similar that's been adopted by a manufacturer or merchant to identify goods and distinguish those goods from any others that are manufactured and sold in the field as competitors. Service marks, on the other hand, are any sort of mark that's used in, the, in connection with selling or advertising services of one person and distinguishing it from its competitors. For example, San Antonio Spurs uh, are a professional basketball team playing in the NBA, located in, in San Antonio. They, uh, this is their trademark, and when we see that trademark, we start to uh, we develop an association with the history of success of the Spurs, some of the players that have played, some of their championships, their geographic location. Whereas we get a completely different association with the Grand Rapids Drive, which is a NBA DL team that we really don't know that much about, so we don't really have strong feelings about it. Same happens with goods. Uh, when you see something like a, a, a Pepsi or a Coke logo, we've got specific feelings uh, that we associate with these trademarks, and it's these um, beliefs and feelings are by design. The um, company that uh, manufactures and markets these respective goods uh, has invested substantial amounts of money in educating the consumer about what sort of characteristics either Coke or Pepsi have and how they differ in trying to distill into these uh, goods a certain expectation of quality and consistency that we, the consumer, will have when we see them. Uh, when you consume a Coke, you don't expect it to taste like a Pepsi. Similarly with services, when you go to Walt Disney World or when you see uh, Walt Disney World, there's usually a connotation about a family-friendly atmosphere and, and inclusion of Disney characters. Uh, whereas if you went somewhere else, uh, like a haunted house, you probably wouldn't get that sort of connotation. And we see that uh, uh, specific uh, connotations and associations with these different service marks. It also applies with slogans, uh, things like I'm loving it or save money, live better. These respectively are for McDonald's and Walmart. And the consumer associates these slogans with these organizations and specific um, characteristics of these uh, goods and services uh, are also part of uh, w when you hear these slogans. Tr uh, trademarks also can be pre uh, extended to what's called trade dress. And trade dress refers to any sort of um, packaging that doesn't have a functional uh, uh, of functionality, meaning that there's no technological advancement that helps to identify the product or the service to the consumer. So when you see the red um, um, wax looking substance on that whiskey bottle, which is actually bourbon, uh, you think Maker's Mark. When you see the foil around the milk chocolate candy with the little tissue, you think uh, Kirsch's Kiss. So kind of in summation, the purpose of a trademark really is to identify uh, who is actually producing the good or service, and how it's distinguished from others. Um, by understanding the trademark and where that product comes from, the consumer can be protected from deception or confusion from others, other organizations or companies that might want to free ride uh, on the goodwill of, of another company's mark and try to confuse the consumer into thinking that other company's product or service is made by the company that we associate with being of high quality. In addition, um, it helps to dis, uh, provide a consistent level of quality. When you buy a Mercedes-Benz, you're expecting a certain baseline level of quality versus if you're buying a, um, a Hyundai, which might have an emblem on one of their cars that looks like a Mercedes-Benz uh, emblem, and that might fool someone who sees that emblem into thinking it's actually a Mercedes. And companies spend massive amounts of money in advertising and other ways to help to communicate to the consumer the value of these, uh, of these trademarks. We also see trademarks being used in businesses and brands that help to communicate a specific image 
whether it's the Olympics, whether it's ESPN or the Super Bowl, as well as athletes. Athletes now, uh, many star athletes have their own brands and logos. Team brands are common. Uh, when we think about the New York Yankees, we have specific um, associations with a history of winning, being from New York, uh, uh, having a, a long history in Major League Baseball, versus the Miami Marlins, which is pretty much converse in terms of longevity and a history uh, of winning. Distinctiveness uh, is important here because uh, once an organization sets out to, to use a trademark, the level of deference and protection it's given by the federal government in terms of respecting and enforcing trademarks is no, it's through what's known as distinctiveness. Distinctiveness means how strong your trademark is. And the more distinctive your trademark, the more likely it's going to be protected under federal law. The um, most protected trademarks are fanciful, arbitrary, and suggestive marks because they are what's called inherently distinctive. Inherently distinctive means that by itself, by its existence, it will be given a certain level of protection. Fanciful is the most uh, protected type of trademark, meaning that um, the word had been invented solely for the purposes to function as a trademark. Something like eBay or Adidas, these are words that did not exist in the English language until they were used by their respective companies to um, refer to the good or service that the company uh, sells. Arbitrary is a little bit similar in the sense that it is a word that specifically refers to the good or service that the company sells. And that word uh, had not been used in that context before. But this is a word that usually did exist in the English language, but it's now being used in a different way. Something like Apple computers or uh, coach. Uh, coach is not something we would traditionally uh, associate with uh, upscale uh, uh, fashion items or um, um, Apple is traditionally thought of as a fruit, not a computer or technology company. Suggestive is a little bit different. It is a word that uh, subtly connotes something about the service or product but does not actually describe the specific quality of the good or service. So it relates to the mark, but doesn't describe the mark. Something like Under Armour or Nike. Uh, Nike, I believe, is the Greek goddess of victory. Hopefully I got that right. And that kind of references Nike's philosophy as an athletic uh, apparel company. Or Under Armour, um, where in itself, that phrase does not refer to moisture-wicking clothing, and ancillary clothing that the company sells, but instead the uh, act of putting on clothing to protect yourself, which one might argue that's what Under Armour uh, clothing is intended to do. So some sort of subtle reference to a characteristic of the clothing, but not a description. With these three different classes, um, a company applying for trademark protection will receive the uh, comparatively uh, different levels of, an, of inherent distinctive protection. Descriptive marks are marks that describe an aspect of the product, its function, its use, etc. And it's not something that's given in uh, immediate deference as being a valid trademark. And instead, uh, in order to receive trademark protection, that trademark must um, obtain secondary meaning. So the National Football League is descriptive because it describes the league that that uh, that ex that uh, carries out professional football games. So in order to gain secondary meaning, there needs to be some sort of evidence, whether it's through surveys or interviews, that connect the good or service to the company as the sole source of that good or service. And once the um, a company can prove that it's submitted to the, to the federal government through the U.S. Patent Trademark Office and a process is, is uh, undergone to determine whether or not that um, logo or trademark does have secondary meaning. If it does, it's granted protection, and if not, it is not granted protection. Finally, generic marks actually refer to a class of products like Zamboni or Kleenex or Xerox. 
And here we've got an example of the Zamboni being subject to what's called genericide. So if a trademarked term at some point goes from being uh, something that is uh, does qualify for inherent distinctiveness protection or has secondary meaning, but then begins to refer to a class of names, descriptive names, um, it no longer it qualifies for a trademark because a trademark cannot just describe a, a class of names. It can only describe one good or service because if it described a class of names, that would create confusion amongst the consuming public. So Zam a Zamboni ice surfacing uh, machine was really um, supposed to refer to one type of ice resurfacing machines, but now it's common that all ice resurfacing machines are referred to as Zambonis, and that's bad for Zamboni. So they very well might send out cease and desist letters uh, to companies that market themselves as Zamboni machines when it's just a, it's actually an ice resurfacing machine. Um, if a uh, trademark is descriptive and needs to establish secondary meaning, here is a list of factors that will help to establish secondary meaning. If you look at five and six, these are the most powerful because it, it directly shows uh, that the um, consumer associates that trademark with that company. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, trademarks are about protecting uh, and not confusing the, the, the public about who makes uh, a good or service. So here's just a little spectrum of distinctiveness going from uh, fanciful uh, which is the most protected, down to generic. We don't want generic. And as you can see, the most protectable is fanciful. So hopefully this is helpful. So as a brief example, uh, back in 2012, Adidas, who was the official sponsor of the World Cup for it, uh, and used it, uh, wanted to create a soccer ball for the World Cup, um, sought to trademark the, the term brazooka to name the ball that was used as the World Cup soccer ball. Brazooka as a word is made up. It's original. It did not exist in the English lexicon before it was registered. It also conjures up the word Brazil. It sounds like a Spanish term. So what protection, if any, would it fall under for trademark? If it had not existed as a word before being invented, then it would be fanciful, which means that it would receive full protection. And that's why the USPTO registered uh, the application and accepted uh, this as a valid trademark in 2013. Now, while a range of different aspects, whether it's a symbol or a word or a phrase or a uh, trade dress can be protectable as a trademark, color can also be registered as a trademark through secondary meaning. So there's a case involving these four universities and their athletic departments who sued uh, Smack Talk Apparel, which was using uh, the university's primary colors, like in this case, LSU's purple and gold, to create t-shirts uh, that would, in a sense, free ride off of the uh, well-known nature of these athletic departments. So as you can see on the front, this shirt said Bourbon Street or Boston, and on the back it said, it'll be sweet as sugar to refer to LSU competing in the Sugar Bowl. Now, uh, LSU and the rest of, of the schools sued for the trademark infringement on the basis of color. Uh, and Smack Talk said, no, color is not trademarkable. Um, however, the court ruled that Yes, color is trademarkable if it attains secondary meaning. If enough people would associate the colors purple and gold with LSU, um, uh, crimson and cream with Oklahoma, et cetera. Or actually, is that Oklahoma or Alabama? It is Oklahoma. Getting old. So that's important. Just like uh, colors, uh, trade dress is protectable as uh, a trademark in a sense. And that's uh, any sort of packaging that's distinctive and it doesn't have any sort of functionality because if it has functionality, provides some sort of utility, then it's uh, more likely to be given uh, patent protection. To recover for trade dress infringement, a plaintiff must prove that 
it qualifies for uh, trade dress protection, meaning that the trade dress is not functional, and that the trade dress has obtained secondary meaning, meaning that through evidence, whether it's through survey or interviews, people associate that sort of um, uh, dress, whether it's the foil on, um, on Hershey's Kisses or the castle-like architecture of White Castle, the people associate those elements with, with the owner of the good or service. And that that trade dress has achieved second uh, that is achieved secondary meaning, and that the trade dress of the two competing products is confusingly similar. So that's what we're really concerned about with when we're talking about uh, infringement. Infringement is um, the the um, the output of where you have two confusingly similar marks that appear to uh, somehow uh, deceive the consumer. And then they were, were uh, concerned about not deceiving the consumer. So if there's two marks, like down here, 7-Eleven and Super, if the consumer believes that the Super mark is actually related to 7-Eleven, that could create a likelihood of confusion. So, um, First, in order to have a valid trademark infringement cause of action, we, the, the uh, plaintiff's trademark needs to be protected, usually by registering with the federal government. And you get that little R right here. And then we look at the strength of the classification um, or the strength of the mark. You know, is it arbitrary? Is it fanciful? Is it suggestive? And then we look to see uh, whether or not the... Um, other mark is likely to cause confusion. So the key issue is how likely is the consumer to be confused? And we look here at these two shoes. If the consumer wrongfully attributes uh, the owner or manufacturer of these two shoes, let's say that uh, if you look on the left, that's an Adidas, or that the, on the left is a K-Swiss shoe, and the right is an Adidas shoe. But if, if by taking survey evidence, the consumer actually believes the opposite, then that would be evidence of con likelihood of confusion. So absence of showing of likelihood of confusion, there is no wrong. But here is sort of the different factors that will help to show a likelihood of confusion. We look at the strength of the two um, marks involved. We look at the similarity by a side-by-side -side comparison usually, how, uh, whether or not um, the products um, are the same in terms of their good or service. Are they t-shirts and golf shirts? Are they apples and oranges, etc.? We look to see if there's actual likely uh, consumer confusion, if you can introduce evidence showing confusion, and we look to see whether or not the defendant actually knew that this other trademark existed and still used their trademark anyways, ignoring the potential for the consumer to be confused or, at, or worse, trying to capitalize on the, cons on the consumer recognition of the plaintiff's marks. Now, finally, we look at the sophistication of the buyers. So here is an example of a likelihood of confusion test using the Polaroid factors. So in the middle here, we've got the intellectual property of the University of Georgia, the Bulldogs. And then in between the intellectual property or outside of it, you've got the good, which is Batlin Bulldog beer. So if we were going to try to decide if we were playing uh, judge, whether or not there was a likelihood of confusion, we would compare all of these marks or all of these, um, all of these uh, prongs of the Polaroid factors to decide whether or not infringement exists. So we'd look to see at how strong was the mark of the University of Georgia. Um, Georgia Bulldogs, that's more descriptive, so it would need to get secondary meaning. Um, Batlin Bulldog beer, uh, that would also be descriptive. Uh, we look at the how whether or not they look the same, the marks, and we look at the products, are they the same? We looked at uh, whether or not the consumer has would be confused. So I'll leave it up to you folks to decide whether or not this was infringement. So 
if by chance a defendant was found to be in violation of trademark laws due to infringement, there are certain defenses that the, that the defendant can uh, employ. Fair use basically means that it's a public policy defense, meaning that, uh, yes, we're, we're in, engaging in infringement, but we are not uh, liable because of something else, such as perhaps um, that it's for educational purposes or if uh, we're trying to use it for the purposes of something it, for it being newsworthy um, or if we're doing comparative advertising. Uh, but uh, if there is some sort of commercial element to the infringer's use, then fair use is probably not acceptable as a defense. Parody is where um, the infringement occurs in the context of some sort of social commentary or satire, or they're trying to make a point. Again, uh, it's usually less aspects about commercial speech and more about the non-commercial speech. Uh, speech. Uh, abandonment is where the plaintiff actually has stopped using their mark in commerce, or they um, they just uh, are not continuing to a advertise with that trademark. So, for example, a restaurant in New York called the Brooklyn Dodgers Diner was sued by Major League Baseball um, for the use of its uh, mark. And they said that it infringes on the Brooklyn Dodgers trademark. However, the Brooklyn Dodgers trademark had, been not, had not been used for 20 years. And since that mark had not been used uh, continuously in advertising, um, the diner actually won. Finally, a hot button issue is involving cancellation of trademarks. And um, with this, uh, we have seen uh, the saga involving the Washington Redskins uh, and different Native American uh, um, nations uh, suing for its cancellation based on the notion that it is disparaging or scandalous or against public policy. So uh, right now, um, the Redskins lost on appeal, and this mark was canceled, and it, now they're trying to appeal to the Supreme Court. So if a mark was canceled, uh, that means there's no more trademark protection federally, and the trademark uh, owner would now only be able to fall back uh, with state and common law uh, use, which is less comprehensive and would allow potentially other companies to uh, infringe on those mark on that trademark without any sort of um, repercussions. So again, it's important for us as future sport managers to understand uh, the, the concept of intellectual property and how each uh, element differs from the other and how they should be properly used in connection with advertising and marketing of an organization. Also, um, if there is a potential legal issue, sport managers and sport marketers should understand how to mitigate and minimize the potential liability an organization would face for violation of, uh, of others' intellectual property or misuse of intellectual property. So I hope that this was helpful, and I hope you all have a great day.